I'm John Horden, and the title of this talk is Pseudo Singularity Defended. Here I'll further defend the plural view of groups, which I've previously defended together with Dan Lopez de Sa. According to this view, each group is identical to its members. In other words, each group is identical to the plurality of its members, so groups are pluralities. On this view, a group isn't a thing, it's some things or some pluralities, if it's a group of groups. For instance, a group of people is just those people. In particular, I'll defend the plural view of groups against some objections recently raised by Eric Snyder and Stuart Shapiro, plus another potential objection. These objections have to do with the closely related linguistic notion of pseudo-singularity. In their book, Plural Logic, Alex Oliver and Timothy Smiley claim that some definite group nouns, for instance, the suit of cards and the pair of logicians, are pseudo-singular terms, known elsewhere as disguised plurals. These are terms that are syntactically singular, but semantically plural, which is to say that despite their misleadingly singular surface form, such terms are standardly used to denote two or more things together. Here we have the converse of pseudo-plural terms like the trousers, the sunglasses, and the scissors. Importantly, this idea promises to explain the coherence of many tempting many one identity claims. For instance, on the face of it, any pair of logicians is identical to two logicians. But thankfully, that isn't to say that one thing can be identical to two things, because a pair isn't a thing at all. Rather, it's two things. Oliver and Smiley, however, only apply this idea to a very limited range of group nouns. For instance, pair, couple, trio, suit of cards, and multitude. So why don't they treat group nouns in general as pseudo-singular? While discussing the related mathematical notion of a set, they say, For more than three centuries, set has been in ordinary use in English to mean a collection of things connected by resemblance or natural production or function. Hence, sets of books, or sets of teeth, or sets of tools, and they are often given their own special names, flocks, committees, and so on. Such everyday sets are not a reliable guide for us, since they are not determined by their membership alone. Different committees may have the same members, and the same committee may have different members over time. A flock may vanish simply because its members disperse. The idea here is that mathematical sets if there really are such things, are defined by their membership alone, and exist whenever their members do. So flocks, committees and so on, can't be identified with mathematical sets. Oliver and Smiley apparently refrain from treating paradigmatic group terms like flock and committee as pseudo-singular for just the same reasons. That is, unlike flocks and committees, pluralities are defined by their members, and exist whenever their members do. In fact, back in 1971, Max Black proposed to treat all group nouns as pseudo-singular. However, he didn't anticipate the objections mentioned by Oliver and Smiley. The two most frequent objections to this plural view of groups are first, that groups can change in membership whereas pluralities cannot, and second, that different groups can have exactly the same members while different pluralities cannot. Here Oliver and Smiley also mention a third objection. A flock may vanish simply because its members disperse, i.e. a group needn't exist as long as its members do, whereas in contrast, any plurality, since it just is its members, necessarily exists as long as its members do. In our previous paper, we have defended the plural view of groups against these objections as follows. The first standard objection is that groups can change in membership, whereas pluralities cannot. Here we reply that group terms like the Supreme Court are non-rigid social role terms, analogous in this respect to semantically singular social role terms like the Chief Justice. Hence the Supreme Court used to have different members and could have had different members, just as the Chief Justice used to be someone else and could have been someone else. Still, those nine people are now the Supreme Court, just as John Roberts is now the Chief Justice. It's true that the same group had different members before, but only insofar as some other people were previously the very same type of group. 
i.e. occupied the same specific collective social role. Likewise, someone else was the same judicial officer before, but only insofar as someone else was previously the very same type of judicial officer, i.e. occupied the same specific individual social role. The second standard objection is that unlike pluralities, two or more different social groups can have exactly the same members. Here we reply that just like individual role holders, the same plurality of people can occupy two or more different social roles at once. For instance, those nine people could simultaneously be both the Supreme Court and the Special Committee on Judicial Ethics, just as John Roberts could simultaneously be both the Chief Justice and the head of the Special Committee on Judicial Ethics. What is involved in being the Supreme Court differs from what is involved in being the Special Committee, just as what is involved in being the Chief Justice differs from what is involved in being the head of the Special Committee. And we may sometimes use a social role term, like the Supreme Court or the Chief Justice, to name the corresponding social role. But as far as the occupants of these roles are concerned, we have no more reason to distinguish the Supreme Court from the Special Committee than we do to distinguish the Chief Justice from the head of the Special Committee. The further objection mentioned by Oliver and Smiley is that a group needn't exist as long as its members do, whereas in contrast, any plurality necessarily exists as long as its members do. Here we reply that a plurality can persist without occupying its associated collective role, just as an individual can persist without occupying its associated individual role. For a government or department to be created, is for the corresponding collective role to be first assigned, and for a government department to be abolished is for the corresponding collective role to be vacated. Likewise, for a government minister to be created is for the corresponding individual role to be first assigned, and for a government minister to be abolished is for the corresponding individual role to be vacated. The same goes for flocks of birds, except here the relevant collective role is acquired and lost organically rather than by means of any formal decisions. Hence, a flock may vanish simply because its members disperse. The birds survive their dispersal, but they cease to be a flock. So, to sum up, when Margaret Thatcher notoriously declared, there's no such thing as society, she did in fact speak truly, but not because there's no society, but rather because society isn't a thing. Rather, British society, or any society for that matter, is many things. More specifically, it's many people. However, Snyder and Shapiro have recently argued that Oliver and Smiley's thesis of pseudo-singularity is linguistically and logically untenable, thus providing a further line of argument against the plural view of groups. Next I'll reply to the three main objections. Then I'll consider a related, but previously undiscussed puzzle about the expression is one of. To illustrate Snyder and Shapiro's objections here, Let's imagine that there's a huge class of tiny children, and no other class or children. Then, according to the plural view of groups, the class is identical to the children. Snyder and Shapiro, however, claim that this identity claim has absurd consequences. They offer three reductio ad absurdum arguments to this effect. The first argument goes as follows. 1. The class is huge. 2. The class is identical to the children. Then from 1 and 2 we infer 3. The children are huge. Then from 3 we draw the conclusion each child is huge. But given our initial supposition that each child is tiny, the conclusion is absurd. Here the reply is that the argument equivocates on huge. The class is huge, if true, amounts to the class is huge in number. That gives us the children are huge in number, which could be clumsily abbreviated as the children are huge. But huge in number is a collective predicate. If some things are huge in number, then it doesn't follow that each of them is huge in number. So on this first reading of huge, the conclusion each child is huge doesn't follow. Meanwhile, the children are huge is naturally read as the children are each huge in dimensions. But even assuming that the class is identical to the children, the children are each huge in dimensions doesn't follow from the class is huge in number. So also on this second reading of huge, 
the conclusion each child is huge it doesn't follow. The second argument goes as follows. 1. Each child is tiny, which implies 2. The children are tiny. And from that, together with 3, the class is identical to the children, we draw the conclusion the class is tiny. But given our initial supposition that the class is huge, the conclusion is absurd. Here the reply is that the argument equivocates on tiny. The class is tiny is naturally read as the class is tiny in number, in which case the conclusion is indeed incompatible with our initial suppositions. However, the class is tiny can also be read, albeit with some difficulty, as the class members are each tiny in dimensions, which is compatible with our initial supposition that the class is huge in number. To see this more clearly, consider the following assertion. My mother, father, four grandparents, seven siblings, ten uncles, eleven aunts, 52 cousins and 37 nieces and nephews are all under 1.6 metres tall. My family is tiny. Here it's clear that the last sentence can be understood as saying that the speaker's family members are each tiny in dimensions. Moreover, in general, a disambiguation could be unobvious, yet still available. For instance, the fireworks weren't loud might mean the fireworks weren't garishly coloured. And here's a third argument. 1. The children are among the children. 2. The class is identical to the children. From 1 and 2 we infer the class is among the children. Then from 4, there's just one class, we infer 5. The class is one thing. Then from 3 and 5 we infer 6. The class is one of the children. From which we draw the conclusion, the class is the child. And of course, the conclusion is absurd. However, this argument illicitly assumes that pluralities can't be counted without somehow treating them as things. The fact that there's one class doesn't imply that the class is one thing. It's not. It's one plurality. So the argument breaks down at step 5. And we can directly count pluralities. If G.E. Moore were a fan of plural logic, he might reason as follows. Here are five fingers, and here are another five fingers, so there are at least two pluralities of fingers. Now, Snyder and Shapiro don't raise the next objection, but it's quite similar to the last one, yet it seems harder to answer. Again, it takes the form of a reductio ad absurdum. 1. There's just one class. From 1 we infer both 2. The class is one of the classes, and 3. The class is identical to the classes. Then we add the premise 4. The class is identical to the children. Then from 3 and 4 we infer 5. The classes are identical to the children. Then from 2 and 5 we infer 6. The class is one of the children. From which we draw the conclusion. The class is a child. And again the conclusion is absurd. So how should we respond? It's hard to say. But there are various possible replies, some of which seem better than others. First possible reply, reject 2, the class is one of the classes. The problem here is that this sentence is true. Compare sentence K. Kamala Harris is one of the women who have been elected US Vice President. Now, in case there's any doubt, an expression of the form, the women who meet a certain condition, can denote one woman. Suppose someone knows that the Vice President and the President of the Senate are both women, but doesn't know that they're both Kamala Harris. Then we might tell that person, the women who you are thinking of are one and the same. Now, consider the women who have been elected Vice President. Is Kamala Harris one of them? Of course she is. One might protest. She isn't one of the women who have been elected Vice President. She's the only one. But that sounds like a case of metalinguistic negation i.e. a protest against an inappropriate way of speaking. The problem with sentence K isn't that it's false, but rather that it's misleadingly weak. Likewise for 2, the class is one of the classes. Second possible reply, reject 3, the class is identical to the classes, perhaps on the ground that it sounds ungrammatical. One might think that a syntactically singular term can never be combined with a syntactically plural term to form a true identity statement. 
but for defenders of pseudo-singularity and the plural view of groups, this reply simply isn't an option. For if we said this, then we'd have to reject sentences like the class is identical to the children by parity of reasoning. Besides, the class is identical to the classes is grammatical, as can be seen by considering sentences like the couple at the heart of the story is Romeo and Juliet, and my trousers are identical to this garment. Third possible reply. Reject 5. The classes are identical to the children. Again, this isn't an option. The classes are identical to the children is certainly grammatical, and it follows from 3 and 4. Fourth possible reply. Reject 6. The class is one of the children. This can be done by finessing the semantics of is one of, so that 6 doesn't follow from 2 and 5. First, Suppose we understand the plural predicate is a member of, symbolised like so, as irreflexive. So nothing is a member of itself, and no plurality is a member of itself. Then we can define a further disjunctive predicate, is either a member of or identical to, symbolised like so. Then we partially define is one of as follows. First, x is one of the f's where the F's is a syntactically plural definite description, means X is either a member of or identical to the F's, and X is an F. Second, X is one of the F, where the F is a syntactically singular definite description, means X is a member of the F. And finally, X is one of A, where A is a syntactically singular name, means X is a member of A. So, on this analysis, the expression is one of turns out to be subtly context sensitive. Which relation it expresses depends on which term appears in its second argument place. Thus, it turns out to be similar to other context sensitive predicates. For instance, is so called because of their size, which expresses different properties depending on which name it's attached to. Now, I imagine that someone might object to the last reply by saying that we shouldn't treat logical predicates like is one of is context sensitive because logical predicates are supposed to be invariant in meaning. But according to this reply, the relevant logical predicates here are is a member of and is either a member of or identical to, which are defined in terms of the basic logical notions of plural membership and identity. And these logical predicates are invariant in meaning. It just turns out that is one of the natural language expression isn't quite equivalent to either of them. Still, if you don't like the last reply, here's another option. Accept 6, the class is one of the children, but deny that it entails 7, the class is the child. This can be done by uniformly interpreting is one of as is either a member of or identical to. Then we can say that the stronger claim the class is a member of the children would entail the class of the child, but on the hypothesized interpretation of is one of, the class is one of the children doesn't entail the class of the child. Now obviously someone might object that the last reply as follows. Really? The class is one of the children is true? No way, that sounds awful. The reply here is, yes, it sounds awful but it's just pragmatically inappropriate. On this interpretation of is one of, the problem with the class is one of the children isn't that it's false, but rather that it's misleadingly weak. The pragmatically appropriate thing to say would be the class is all of the children. And for what it's worth, the present reply avoids the semantic complications of the previous one. So in conclusion, Snyder and Shapiro's objections can be answered. There is a related puzzle about the expression is one of, but there are a couple of reasonable options for dealing with it. The best two solutions to this puzzle correspond to two different ways of interpreting is one of in natural language. But for now, we needn't choose between them. In any case, for the purposes of doing plural logic, we can use the predicates is a member of and is a member of or identical to. So, despite the linguistic complications that have been revealed, pseudo-singularity is ultimately unproblematic. So the plural view of groups remains undefeated.